are they? Violent, savage, lawless, or friendly to strangers, God-fearing men? In other words, he says, I want to go over there. Now, there's no real reason for him to do this. They're on their way home. Note the irony, they just left the land of the lotus eaters. Let's not get distracted, and yet here we are, and it's Odysseus now. It's not his men that say, let's go over and take a look. Well, of course, this is going to be the famous Polyphemus scene, right? Well, he's seen Polyphemus' cave. It's a giant's lair. He's clearly a loner, we're told, at, at, at 201, a grim loner. Dead set in his own lawless ways. He is a man mountain. He's a huge giant. Odysseus will pick 12 men, the number 12 he likes in these stories. 12 men. And he takes with him special wine. And then we get a whole history of this wine that's incredibly strong. It's going to help us, obviously, um, later in the story with Polyphemus, right? And off they go, right? Um, there is a sudden foreboding that we're told about at line 235. To um, told my fighting spirit I'd soon come up against some giant clad in power like armor plate, a savage, deaf to justice, blind to law, in other words, a savage. Um, and sure enough, they find the cave. Now, when we do our Plato's Republic, Book 7, the cave allegory is significant, right? And there's no question that when Plato wrote the cave allegory in Republic 7, readers knew that, oh yeah, the cave, yeah, right, in the cave you learn stuff, and you go through a lot of fear and pain to get there, right? We'll come back to it in our study of Plato, right? At line 250, we're told, 251, from the start, my comrades pressed me, pleading hard, let's make away with these cheeses they have found in the cave, and then come back and get the lambs and stuff. Uh, but I, he says, would not give way, and how much better it would have been, not till I saw him, saw the gifts he gave. There's two things Odysseus wants. He wants to see this giant, right? And secondly, he wants teammates, Scooby Snacks. He wants gifts, right? And, of course, this is going to be bad. And he proved no lovely sight to my companions. So we have more eating, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, the giant Polyphemus, the one-eyed Cyclops, shows up, right? we got this huge rock. We're reminded of the way rocks play a role in the Iliad. This huge rock which covers the, the cave. And then we have the first words after the fire has been lit, and Polyphemus, the one-eyed giant, will speak. As soon as he did so, he says, Strangers! And he thunders out, now, who are you? And obviously this is the question so often asked in the Odyssey. Where did you sail from over the uh, running sea lanes? Out on a train spree or roving the waves like pirates? By the way, this is interesting because this is the uh, common wording, the same wording that we hear um, in Book 8 at line uh, 185 when um, Versaris will make fun of Odysseus and in fact insult him, right? Out on a trading spree like pirates. The heart inside us, Odysseus said, shook, terrified by his rumbling voice. He said, however, nevertheless, I found nerve to answer firmly. We think about his boy Telemachus having to learn how to speak. And here is Odysseus, the great speaker. And he says it this way. First words of Odysseus when he speaks to the monster. He says, we are men of Achaea, bound now from Troy. Starts dropping, obviously, the hint that we're from Troy and therefore worthy of, of, of respect. Driven off course by the warring winds over the vast gulf of the sea, battling home on a strange tack, a route that's off the map. And so we've come to you. So it must please King Zeus's plodding heart. We're glad to say we're men of Atreides, Agamemnon, whose fame, Kleos, is the proudest thing on earth these days. So great a city he sacked. Such multitudes he killed. Note the irony. To show that Odysseus is civilized and therefore worthy of Xenia, guest-host relationship, he says, we destroyed the city of Troy, obviously by extension, the, the city of the Coneys, is, uh, the Coneys as well, right? Um, but he says, since we've chanced on you, we're at your knees, supplicant, in hopes of warm welcome, even a guest gift, Zania, right? The sort that hosts give strangers, that's the custom, respect the gods, my friend. Um, we're supplicants at your mercy. Zeus of the stranger's guard, all guests and supplicants, strangers are sacred. Zeus will avenge their rights. And then the monster, the giant, will come back. Stranger, you must be a fool or come from nowhere. This notion of nowhere, no man is, of course, going to play big time here in a second. Telling me to fear the gods or avoid their wrath. Notice this is Polyphemus, who at the end of this book is going to call for his father, Poseidon, to curse Odysseus. We, Cyclops, never blink at Zeus and Zeus's shield of storm and thunder or any blessed god. We've got more force by far. The idea that the Cyclops are actually stronger than the gods is ironic. I never spare you in fear of Zeus's hatred, you or your comrades here, unless I had the urge. But he says, tell me, and then he asks, where's the rest of you? Odysseus is a quick, 
real uh, quick thinker, and he realizes this is a trap. He's a great liar, Odysseus is, and he says that all of our, all of our um, uh, men were lost and our ship was lost. And then we're told at line 323, all of a sudden, Polyphemus lurching up, lurched out his hands toward my men, snatching two at once, remember there's only 12 in the cave with him to make 13, wrapping them on the ground, he knocked them dead like pups. Their brains gushed out all over, soaked the floor, and ripped them limb from limb to, feed, to fix his meal. He bolted them down like a mountain lion, left no scrap, devoured entrails, fresh and bones and marrow and all, looking on at his grisly work, paralyzed. Appalled they were, right? We flung our arms to Zeus and wept and cried out loud, looking on at the grisly work. Paralyzed, appalled, right? And then he goes to sleep, which leaves Odysseus, we've said this many, many times, that Odysseus is constantly caught between two choices. Think about what Achilles would do here, right? Um, we'll, we'll read it and then we'll ask this question. Um, he said, I with my fighting heart thought it first to steal up to this monster, Draw the sharp sword at my hip. Stab his chest where the midriff packs the liver. I groped for the fatal spot, but a fresh thought held me back. There, at a stroke, we'd finish off ourselves as well. How could we, with our hands, heave back that slab, that stone? He set to block the cavern's gaping maw. So we lay there groaning, waiting dawn's first light. Think about this. What makes humans different from other animals? Animals starving uh, or dying of thirst comes up on a water hole. All of the corpses lying around the water hole. Animals still drink often from the water. Why? Dying of thirst. Human will see it, even though dying of thirst, will see all the corpses and immediately say, oh, no, 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 this is bad news. In other words, notice here uh, the decision that Odysseus has to make. This is what makes Odysseus special. What makes him different from Achilles? Achilles would see this happen and he would kill the monster and then all of a sudden he'd have to go, oh, wait, 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 how are we gonna get out of the cave? This is not Odysseus. He's very intelligent. He's calculated in the way he thinks. This, of course, will make Odysseus very much like Machiavelli's prince. Remember what pr the prince uh, is to be in Machiavelli's uh, classic uh, Renaissance treatise. Strategic violence. This is not the Thrasymachan argument of Republic I, might makes right, not at all. Odysseus is smart, so he waits to get his point. Well, of course, in the morning, two more men are gulped down, leaving now only eight of his men and revenge is the plan for Odysseus at line 355, and they've got to get a weapon made. Again, Odysseus is the king of technology, right? Um, they take lots to see who's going to, um, who's going to help. Odysseus, the great problem solver, they're gonna, they make this large telephone pole, sharpen it down, and when, they, uh, uh, when Polyphemus comes back, two more men are killed, and therefore now we're down to six. Odysseus making seven, right? Um, and then Odysseus says, hey, why don't you try some wine at line 390? And as soon as the wine is given, he, he, uh, he begs for more. And then he says, it, tell me your name quickly at line 400 so I can hand my guest a gift to warm his heart. Well, Odysseus will in fact say it. So you ask me the name I'm known by, Cyclops, at line um, 410 or so. I'll tell you. But you must give me a guest gift as you promised. Nobody. That's my name. Nobody. Now, the, the, the Greek here, uh, scholars have pointed out for a long time, the Greek here is important. Metis is the word that's often used for this nobody, which can mean no person. It can also mean somebody who is really crafty. In other words, um, Odysseus is actually telling Polyphemus, I'm messing with your head here, but of course the giant is too stupid, and the whole word of nobody plays well, right? Of course, technically, if you'll think about it, at this point in our story, Odysseus is telling them, and he's just told the Phaeacians who he is. In some ways, Odysseus is nobody. He's not back home. Nobody knows for sure whether he's alive. We've got several moments in the Odyssey where, in fact, people who don't know that it's Odysseus in disguise will talk about Odysseus as if he is now dead and gone, forgotten. Nobody, right? But he says, that's my name, nobody. So my mother and father call me all my friends. But the monster boom back, nobody? I'll eat nobody last of all his friends. I'll eat the others first. That's my gift to you. So obviously a complete violation of Xenia. Although ironically, allegorically, this is exactly what the suitors are doing to Telemachus. They're eating him quite literally out of house and home, right? Well, he passes out because of the, uh, because of the wine. They um, then, and then there's this disgusting moment when we're told that it, he vomits up chunks of human flesh, right, because he's drunk and he vomits, it's gross, right? Odysseus will tell his men, have courage, they shove this thing into the eye of the Cyclops, 
we have these two amazing epic similes at line 430, um, that the way that they drill the, uh, the pole down into the eye, the, he is blinded, right? And, uh, and then uh, po uh, the Polyphemus will, um, will scream out, right? Nobody blinded me. And, and bringing all kinds of other Cyclops to the cave. Of course, the cave is closed up because of the, the large boulder. At line 450, they will ask, what Polyphemus, what in the world's the trouble? This is the first time Polyphemus' name gets used. By the way, Polyphemus means much fame. And it is significant that this is a monster who is named. The Cyclops are just the people, right? And here it is, Polyphemus. Um, he, uh, he, um, what Polyphemus? What in the world's the trouble? Roaring out in the God sent night to rob us of our sleep. These are the other Cyclopses um, who are asking the question. Surely no one's wrestling your flocks against your will. And he says it, nobody, friend. He will bellow. Nobody's killing me now by fraud and not by force. Um, and, and the friends will say, "Well, if you're alone and nobody's trying to overpower you now, look, it must be a plague sent by the mighty uh, by the mighty Zeus. You better pray to your father, Lord Poseidon, we hear for the first time." And of course, if you're the Phaeacians, you would think that they would kind of sit up and say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa wait!" So you're telling me that he messed around with Poseidon's son and got Poseidon fired up at him? Wasn't there like this prophecy that was mentioned earlier about how the Phaeacians are somehow going to get jacked by Poseidon? They don't put it together. By the way, we are told that at line 463, Odysseus laughs to himself. This is the second time we've got this laughter thing going on. And then, of course, there's the plotting for the escape. He says at line 470, he says, I was already plotting. What was the best way out? How can I find escape from death for my crew myself as well? My wits, this is a beautiful line, my wits kept weaving, weaving cunning schemes. And again, this has been the motif right from the very beginning. We go all the way back to the Iliad, in fact. The first time we meet Helen, there she is, weaving. This notion that weaving and storytelling go together is somehow a really important way that we think about art and the idea of art as being a kind of weaving, right? Finally, he does come up with his plan. This is the plan that many scholars have pointed out. has got all kinds of interesting Freudian readings as well from out of the cave, hanging upside down on the underside of these ram. They're going to somehow get out, right? Tucked up and under, um, if you will. And then we'll have Polyphemus, who's smart enough to feel on top, but not smart enough to feel underneath. The large ram that Odysseus is going to hang under, in fact, he will stroke him gently, we're at line uh, 500 or so. And he'll have this conversation where he says to him, why are you last of all? And he says it, sick at heart for your master's eye, that coward gouged out with his wicked crew, only after he'd stunned my wits with wine. That, that, nobody. Who's not escaped his death, I swear, not yet. Oh, if only you thought like me, speaking to the ram, if only you thought like me, had words like me, to tell me where that scoundrel is cringing from my rage. I'd smash him against the ground. I'd spill his brains flooding across my cave. That would ease my heart of the pain that good for nothing nobody made me suffer. Uh, now, it's interesting here. Polyphemus says it out loud. I wish that this brute ram could be more like me and could talk, could communicate, right? Notice Odysseus thinks of Polyphemus as nothing more than some kind of savage brute. And yet here he says, I wish you could tell me. Of course, the irony is that um, it's right there Odysseus is, right underneath, right? Uh, 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 hanging up, upside down. Well, they get out, they get to the boats, and Odysseus, do you know guys like this? Odysseus is one of those guys, he just can't let it go. Winning is not enough. Now we've got to have the taunting. And uh, of course, in our study of the Iliad, we saw this, it seems like, every, almost every Aristia, that word gets used here for the battle scene, right, in the Iliad. Here we'll have the same thing. Odysseus can't let it go, and so he's got to start taunting, stinging taunts, calling back to the Cyclops at line 530. He says, so, Cyclops, no weak coward it was whose crew you bent to devour there in your vaulted cave, you with your brute force. Your filthy crimes came down on your own head, you shameless cannibal, daring to eat our, your guests in your own house. So Zeus and the other gods have paid you back. The violation of Zenia, in other words, will get paid back. This is, again, setting us up, obviously, for the end of the Odyssey, right? 
Um, and again, he calls the, his his um, his his uh, soldiers, his sailors are going to say, "Do would you just shut up?" But again, he began. He says, "I begin to taunt because there's a large boulder that the Cyclops will throw." We're back to more boulder throwing from the Iliad, right? Um, and it brings the ship back. He, and we're told again, Odysseus admits, "I had to do it." The sailors, he says at line 550, were trying to tell me to shut up, check me, call me. Um, he said. Um, so headstrong, they say, so, so headstrong. Why? Why rile the beast again? Um, and, and, but he says, um, Odysseus says, I could not bring my fighting spirit round, line um, 453, uh, 455, 456. Um, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 560. Um, he says, I couldn't bring my fighting spirit round. I call back another burst of anger. Cyclops! If any man on the face of the earth should ask you, who blinded you, shamed you so, say... Odysseus, raider of cities, he gouged out your eye. Laertes' son, who makes his home in Ithaca. So I vaunted. And he groaned back in answer, Oh, no, no, that prophecy years ago. Now we've seen this in the Iliad. We certainly see it in the Odyssey. This idea that long ago there was this prophecy that was made, and all of a sudden it comes to fruition. And when it comes to fruition, it's too late. And you kind of go, Oh, no, this is what he says, right? He says, Once there was this prophet that told me, that I would be blinded by somebody named Odysseus, he says. But I always look for a handsome giant man to cross my path, some fighter clad in power like armor plate. But now, look, what a dwarf, a spineless, good-for-nothing, obviously play on words, right? Good-for-nothing stuns me with wine and gouges out my eye. Come here, Odysseus. Let me give you a guest gift. That's, again, playing off of the Xenia thing, right? And urge Poseidon, the earthquake god, to speed you home. I'm his son. He claims to be my father. Think about what Telemachus said. I'm told that Odysseus is my father. True, and he himself will heal me if he pleases. No other blessed God. No man can do that work. And Odysseus comes back. Heal you? Yeah, yeah, I'll heal you. I would love to heal you. Let me jack on you some more and send you down to the house of death. Then we're told um, at, at line um, um, 585 or so. At that, Polyphemus bellows to Lord Poseidon. Now again, guys, the Phaeacians are listening to Odysseus tell this story. It would make sense for them to sit up and pay attention, given that in Book 8, line 632, Alcyonus mentions the fact that there's this prophecy that is going to come, possibly, to the Phaeacians because Poseidon is mad at them. Polyphemus thrusting his arms to the, se to the uh, sky, and he says, Hear me, Poseidon, God of the uh, sea blue me, who rocks the earth. If I am truly your son, and you claim to be my father, come, grant that Odysseus, raider of cities, Laertes' son, who makes his home in Ithaca, never reaches home, or if he's fated to see his people once again and reach his well-built house, his own native country, let him come home late and come a broken man. Tiresias in book 11 is going to say the same thing, line 125 to 135. Circe will say the same thing to, to, to Odysseus in book 12, line 148 to 153. This notion of you're going to get home, but when you get there, you will be a broken man, right? All his shipmates lost, alone in a stranger's ship, and let him find a world of pain at home. So he prayed, the god of the sea blue main, Poseidon, heard his prayer. Well... I mean, if the Phaeacians are paying attention at all and taking notes, they should probably sit up at this point and say, whoa, 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 the reason he's here alone is because Poseidon jacked him, and we're going to help him, which means Poseidon will probably jack us, never, never connect the dots. They end up getting away, they end up feasting, um, uh, Odysseus will sacrifice uh, that ram that allowed him to get out, and this is kind of the end of the, uh, the, end of the project. Um, for the famous story. All right, let's do really quickly level two and three. Um, at level 2A, well, think about the savagery, right? It's all in the eye of the beholder, right? Um, it's okay to jack this, the, the city of the Sicones or, or, or of Troy. It's not okay for Polyphemus, however, to do something very similar. And again, the cultural irony, right? Anytime one culture who has been a dominant culture will tell a less dominant culture, you're not allowed to perpetrate acts of violence on innocent people. Uh, and of course, the obvious question is, be, well, didn't you do that before as you were gaining your power? In our study of American thought and history, we obviously have pointed this out a number of times, haven't we, right? Notice Odysseus is the, another message. Odysseus 
is the great innovative problem solver. He is in many ways the true, ultimate Western hero, right? Far more than Achilles, who, as we pointed out, would just kill Polyphemus. Odysseus has a, a way of using his mind, right? Again, the law of karma comes into play, right? You don't get away with nothing, the law of karma, right? Polyphemus gets his jack. Odysseus ultimately will get his jack. The Phaeacians will get theirs as well. The suitors will, of course, get theirs. At level 2b, think about the rhetoric here. The whole story, right, is Odysseus's way to say, it's not my fault. The reason why, for example, that all of his men will get killed is because of Poseidon. Of course, he's the one that gave away that he was, in fact, Odysseus, right? Um, again, Odysseus will be making the argument, it's not my fault. It's his men's fault, or it's the women, Circe and Calypso's fault, or it's the gods, Zeus and Poseidon, right? Notice Odysseus rarely takes personal responsibility, but he does say in this story, I should have listened to my men. That was bad form, right? The symbolism, well, the Sikonis, we've already said, symbolize the, the vulnerability of an innocent people that are just going to get jacked, like the Trojans, of course, like the Phaeacians. The land of the Lotus Eaters and the symbolism there is self-evident, right? To be distracted and taken away from, uh, from your ambition. The Cyclops, in general, they, of course, symbolize the whole notion of nature versus civilization, right? They're uncivilized. Polyphemus, of course, is the monster that you have to somehow be able to defeat through guile. My name is nobody. And finally, Odysseus here symbolizing the modern man, we might even say, the modern hero. The irony, of course, is that the Phaeacians, again, should be somewhat concerned that Odysseus is a cursed man, got no interest in it. Of course, the real irony of this story is that the nobody, the classic example of irony, right? And I ask this question, why is that so funny? Why is that so humorous? Students have always loved this, this story. At 3A, we have making our comparisons to the Iliad. Polar is obviously important in the Iliad. We mentioned that. Um, again, as we said, this is the difference between the Achilles of the Iliad and the, uh, and the Odysseus of the Odyssey, right? Um, Troy... Um, in the Iliad, think about this one, and the Sicones, uh, nothing, it seems, has been learned at all. I mean, we just go, we just kill people, and we steal their women or whatever. Um, there's a lot of examples of, of, of the, you know, what's your favorite one from a video game or whatever, especially as it relates to 